so again, my name is Sangmini Labut. I am the executive director here at the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, tonight's event is um, part of the History Reveal series. It is, um, the title of this event is um, a, a book reading, um, Vikings in the Attic. And for this program, um, I'd like to thank our partner, the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Roseville um, Library for their support and partnership. And for folks who want to purchase books in person here, there's um, subtext books that's here to sell some of the title. Um, Eric, I would assume would want to uh, be able to sign those books for you all here. Um, or you can check um, subtext books at um, subtextbooks.com. Um, so please consider um, uh, supporting um, Ramsey County Historical Society, us, Eastside Freedom Library, and, and, and Roseville um, Public Library as well. We really rely on, on support um, of members and friends like yourself to continue this effort. Um, our next um, uh, history reveal program, um, it will be on um, November 10th. Um, it will be a screening of a new documentary film on the farmer labor movement in Minnesota. And so please check our website um, for more details. Um, and as a reminder, um, please keep your microphones and camera on your Zoom turned off during the entire program. You can type your questions and comments in the chat section. And for questions, if you could um, put the letter Q in front of your questions so folks, our moderator, would know that those are questions and not comments. Um, uh, and this program um, is being recorded. Um, it will be up on the Ramsey County Historical Societies um, and the Eastside Freedom Library YouTube channel. And so I'm going to read a land acknowledgement from, from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, the Ramsey County um, Historical Society would like to acknowledge the sacred land, the Dakota land, Minnesota, Makoche, and land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds. Um, is the ancestral and contemporary land, homeland of the Dakota people. Um, it is also home to the Anishinaabe and, the Indi and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledged that um, its sites um, are located on um, and benefit from the sacred um, Dakota land. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to um, preserving our past, informing our present and inspiring our future. Um, part of that is, is to acknowledge the painful history and current challenges facing um, Dakota people just as we celebrate the contribution of um, Dakota and other indigenous folks. As for our full um, um, land acknowledgement statement, um, please visit the Ramsey County Historical Society website at rchs.com. Um, and so we, you know, I, at the Eastside Freedom Library and, and the Ramsey County Historical Society is really committed to presenting these type of stories and history um, of all in our community. Um, and we are pleased to bring um, you all to tonight's program, which is part of, again, History Reveal, but also part of a series called Making Minnesota series, um, exploring the often untold stories, histories, and experiences um, of some of the worldwide um, immigrant, um, African American and indigenous communities that make up our diverse um, um, county and, and, and state. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, and, and we are pleased to have Eric um, Drachny um, returning again. This is your, your second um, uh, history review series. And so Eric is an author, um, is the author of 20 um, books, including um, a book that he will be reading tonight, um, Vikings in the Attic, um, Weird Minnesota, Never um, Trust a Thin Cook, um, Let's Go Fishing um, for the Love of Cod, and Impossible Road Trip. Um, he write about his 15-year um, experience I'm running um, one of the Concordia language um, village, villages um, in, in northern Minnesota. Um, and as a Fulbright fellow to Norway, he survived a dinner of um, fermented fish. Um, and, and, and thanks to the um, 80 proof um, 
liquid that he consumed afterwards. <laughs> um, and so um, Eric is also a professor of um, English journalism, Italian at Concordia St. Paul. And in the summer is Dean to the Italian Concordia language um, village. And he lives in Minneapolis with his wife and three kids and take it away, Eric. Thank you, Sang. All right, well, it's a treat to be here. Um, it's a beautiful library and to do this series again. Can you hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> well, uh, and it's especially appropriate to be over here on the east side, considering we're, we're right near Swede Hollow and all of the, the poor Swedes and Scandinavians that came into this area as well. Um, <clears throat> so this project began because I had lived over in Norway for a year. Um, and then when we came back trying to figure out, okay, what what sort of Scandinavian history do we actually have? I mean, it just seems sort of bland or something that we didn't really know much about that. And I talked to the University of Minnesota Press and thought, you know, we sh I should dig into some of these other things that we don't really know about. And so I started doing a list of all of the different you know, towns and churches and areas and such. And it got really boring really fast. Like who, you know, it's just sort of a list of all these different things. And then I started uncovering all these other things that like, wait a minute, I never knew about that. So I'm gonna read just a little section here, kind of set it up. And then I'm gonna go through a bunch of the slides and photos. So this involved a lot of road trips all around the Midwest and further afield out to Seattle and other places to discover some of these Scandinavian routes. Um, I always thought that Scandinavians were normal. Growing up with mostly Swedish and Norwegian grandparents and a bit of Danish thrown in for good measure, I assumed our family in the Midwest were the height of rational thought and our culture simply the way people must live if they had any sense. Now, doesn't everyone endure jello-like fish soaked in butter and gut-wrenching meatballs at Christmas time? Speaking of jello, what makes it salad when it's mixed with marshmallows and cool wood? How is that salad? When I asked a Norwegian American woman in Burnsville, Minnesota, about some of these strange Scandinavian habits, she acted surprised. What do you mean we're strange? It's everyone else that's weird. Exactly. One of the Iowa Sons of Norway representatives winced when I mentioned this writing project. He cautioned me with one word, sensitive, as if the Norwegians were gonna come out of the closet with pitchforks. If you feel this way, stop reading now. This is not intended to be outrageous, but this is the book I wished I had had while growing up to shine some light on that dark corner of the closet where we stash our secrets. The topics inside, from curing a cough from turpentine to lice cover sweaters, are not standard textbook fare and hardly a complete view of Scandinavian influence. Instead, these are the stories that my relatives did not pass on to me. Partially because when I was a vain punk rock teenager, I thought I had a little to learn from my Swedish American grandmother who collected silver spoons. But also because perhaps my elderly relatives didn't want the younger generation to know the truth. I didn't want to write a book promoting Scandinavian exceptionalism as if this culture is somehow superior. Scandinavians already think they're pretty special. We rejected the title, How Scandinavians Saved Western Civilization. That book would be far too proud and anti-Lutheran. In fact, Scandinavian ethnic pride is somehow very un-Scandinavian. You're not supposed to be so proud, so you gotta remember that. I'd often thought that the Scandinavian influence on contemporary life here was watered down, but then we lived in Norway and the Norwegians spoke about our colony in America, and we are the colonists here. Many Midwest, and actually the queen was just here visiting the colony, right? Many Midwesterners refer to themselves as simply Norwegian or Swedish, Finnish, not Norwegian American, Finnish American, even though many have never even been to Scandinavia and can't speak the language. As a fourth generation Scandinavian myself, I could reject or embrace this heritage, but I wanted to learn how this bloodline of stoic skiers affects me. Now, what does it mean to be Scandinavian so many times removed? I mean, does it even matter anymore? So this book results from my interest in that background that promotes festivals extolling the virtues of rhubarb malts and rutabaga malts, and I've got proof of that, of socialist opera houses and of utopian colonies pushing clothes made from flour sacks. 
I wanted to find out why these dirt poor Norwegian settlers scrimped and saved to send their children to Concordia College, to Gustavus, St. Olaf, while they lived in squalid sod houses with snakes slithering through the walls and rain dripping through the roof. After living in Norway for a year, I became aware of its profound, if subtle, influence on the Midwest. Much of it is hard to trace. There is a certain trusting government here. There's a suspicion of flashy style in favor of practical clothes, giant twine balls, I'll show you those too. But other aspects have a direct link, such as the co-op movement, the farmer labor party, and brightly colored decorative stat painting on oversized statues. When we returned from Norway, we moved into a craftsman bungalow in South Minneapolis and removed the old mail slot. Inside, we discovered an unopened letter from the 1920s still stuck down in that slot, written in Swedish. Our house was built by immigrants from Sweden, influenced by the arts and crafts movement. They spoke Swedish in our house. So just below that surface is the Scandinavian presence. I set out to find the herring chokers from the Ludif Ludifisk belt, and who are these supposed Asian black fins and the Swedish roundheads? I understood that our history has been rewritten when I visited Swedish relatives in the tiny town of Larv near Göteborg in Sweden. They lugged out a big book that chronicled our family tree back through the centuries. Over coffee with heavy cream and Swedish pastries, we noticed one name was conveniently blotted out and a broken line that disconnected this person from the rest of the family tree. The family genealogist said, we don't think we're related to him because he was a bad egg and a rascal who was finally brought in front of a judge for his mischief. On the way out of the courtroom, he actually stole the judge's clothes. No, we're definitely not related to him, the genealogist insisted, in spite of the direct link to all of him. So Vikings in the Attic is for all of those who think that the, the Scandinavian history is somehow boring. In reality, it's just been glossed over. My great aunts used to gather for coffee over on the West Bank in Minneapolis. Coffee is the great lubricator. And whenever they switched to speaking Swedish, we knew that some sordid affair had surfaced that the younger generation needn't know. The men, on the other hand, they never said much at all. Just saying, yep, speaks volumes. Slowly, though, I learned some of these secrets. I discovered that the farmhouse that we lived in when I was a baby outside the very Norwegian town of Spring Grove, Minnesota, had been the site of a brutal double murder by a smitten local boy who couldn't marry his beloved because the family disapproved of his behavior. A little wonder, right? My parents always wondered about what looked like bullet holes in the ceiling near the nursery right above my crib. Many stories like this simply stopped being told at the dinner table and were deemed yesterday's news. I mean, who wants to hear that all the time? I had heard that the old language fell into disuse and that these immigrants wanted to learn English. This perpetuated half-truth doesn't tell the tale of government agents spying on Scandinavian meetings looking for socialists or anti-war activists. Settlers spoke English as a matter of self-preservation. Any dissension was deemed unpatriotic. I learned how Scandinavians, more than any other ethnic group, shaped the Midwest into their vision of the promised land. After abject poverty in Scandinavia and a grueling ocean voyage, these hardy immigrants had to band together to survive. They formed cooperatives to stave off the brutal capitalist robber barons. They withstood accusations of unholy rituals with their devilish black books and naked gatherings and sweaty saunas. Most important, they kept their humor and they passed the jello salad. All right, so I'm going to show now some of these, these images from, uh, that I discovered. Okay, actually, that first one. So this is uh, one of these Viking statues that they have down in Spring Grove. And with all the Viking statues around, you would probably think that the Vikings were actually here in the Midwest. But of course, uh, they weren't. But you better not tell too many people that because they will uh, they'll, they'll fight you on that. Believe me, I've received many letters. Um, so you go around the Midwest here. So this is down in Andersonville in Chicago. Um, and that water tower has since been spruced up because the Swedes are obsessed with cleanliness. Um, we get other water towers as well. Um, you probably recognize the one in the, the middle there in Lindstrom, Minnesota. Um, so that during the um, 
their annual town festival, sometimes people will climb up there and put a bunch of dry ice in the spout there so it looks like the coffee is brewing. Then we have down in Stanton, Iowa, we have a couple more uh, coffee pot water towers because that's the home of Mrs. Olson from Folgers fame. Um, so they made this water tower for her. Um, but when you drive into Stanton, there's a big sign there that says, welcome to Stanton, the little white town, which doesn't sound too good, right? Because it's all Swedes, they're all white. But it's actually it's because of all of the buildings are all painted white in the town. <clears throat> um, so when this water tower was deemed too small, they added an, a second water tower, but they couldn't do another coffee pot. So they have a coffee cup water tower. Oh, goodness. Oh, what's going on here? Okay, so then we have a bunch of the troll statues that we have around. Um, we have, uh, and any, anytime you see a Zamboni ice resurfacer, you can thank a Norwegian figure skater. Um, so Zambonis, I found out, were made down in Southern California, not in Canada, not in Minnesota. So Sonia Haney, after she won all of her Olympic medals, she went down to Southern California, met Frank Zamboni, um, and told him, sell me that thing that he called the thingamajig that's made on an old Willie's Jeep frame. She brought it around all around the country and made Zamboni ice resurfacers famous. So when you go around, you'll see some of these, what they call stabur, these old Norwegian storage sheds. Um, you'll see the, the replica stave churches. This one actually used to be in southern Wisconsin. And about six years ago, uh, Little Norway down there closed up and they sent it back to Orkonger in Norway. So it was built in Norway, came here for about 100 years and then went home. Here, this we have up in Door County. Uh, this is in Chapel, the Chapel of the Hills in Rapid City, South Dakota. And here, this is in Minot, all of these stave churches. So these are all sort of examples of the Scandinavian pre presence here. Um, this is a the uh, wheat palace that they had up in Thief River Falls to rival the corn palace out in Mitchell, South Dakota. Um, then, of course, you've seen many of the dollar horses around. Um, so this is the one over in Minot. We have one in Mora, Minnesota. Um, there's a 50 foot tall one over in Mora, Sweden. Um, and then we have St. Urho. Uh, St. Urho is a Finnish saint that was sort of invented or created up in northern Minnesota that who chased the grasshoppers out of Finland to save the grape crop and the wine crop supposedly that's how the story goes um, and now they're just starting to hear about this back in Finland so we have a whole different culture here that they don't have back in Scandinavia for example the twine ball out in Darwin Minnesota um, this was created by Francis Johnson he spent 29 years of his life gathering twine and winding this ball. I'm very proud of his Swedish background, He's painted the entire side of a barn as the Swedish flag. Meanwhile, all the other neighbors just thought he was kind of crazy doing all of this. Um, and now it even has its own mailbox and Weird Al Yankovic wrote a song about it. So going through some of the other things, you know, because the many of the Scandinavian traits of our area have been sort of dissipated over time. And I think if in Minnesota, for example, if you have one ethnic, the largest ethnic group in Minnesota is of course the Germans, right? But then when World War I broke out, suddenly no one was German anymore, okay? Um, and the Scandinavians were also viewed as suspicious and all of that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but if you put all the Scandinavians together as one group, they actually outnumber the Germans. And you think with all of these Scandinavians around, how come there are, essentially no Scandinavian restaurants. And there's Norsky Nook in Wisconsin. There's a couple others that I can think of. But really, it's mostly, you know, Italian food, Mexican food, Thai food, all these other kinds of food, right? But Scandinavian food, it's basically non-existent. Um, and this is why. Like, who would come up with the idea of rutabaga malts, right? Only the, the Danes, are actually, in this case, up in Askov. Um, <clears throat> and then we have Lefsa, which, of course, is delicious. Now, Lefsa, I learned there's a little bit more to the background here. So in Norway, sometimes they don't even make Lefsa with potatoes. But here in, in the Midwest, it's always made with potatoes. And during World War I, this is a storefront in St. Paul that talked about how you need to eat your potatoes because eating potatoes was a patriotic act. 
In fact, it said every potato is a bullet fired point blank at a made in Germany piece, right? So in other words, eat your potatoes to kill Germans because if you ate potatoes, you weren't eating wheat because that flour could be sent over to the front and wouldn't spoil, whereas potatoes would spoil by the time they made it over there. So you didn't want to waste any food as we went through. Um, so looking back too, so some of the traditions that have since been lost back in Scandinavia, Scandinavia have been preserved here. Um, so I went through some of these old cookbooks and a lot of the things are simply gone. But some of them, for example, Swedish egg coffee. Um, so this is coffee that you mix an egg into the grounds, that this has been preserved here, whereas the Swedes basically don't know about it anymore. So in the summer, as Sang mentioned, I run one of the language villages. There's also a Swedish language village. When those Swedes come over in the summer, I ask them, well, do you make egg coffee? Does your grandma make egg coffee? They've never even heard of it at this point. So these, a lot of these traditions and some of the dialects have been preserved here in the Midwest and they're gone elsewhere. Um, and so I can't, I can't over, I can't overemphasize how much coffee is important to the Scandinavian cultures. So when we talk, I usually think, you know, the Italians and the French, they're the ones who are drinking all the coffee, right, with their beautiful cafes and espresso and all of that. Actually, the number one drinkers of coffee are the Finns. And it's about double what the French and the, the Italians drink. And the, the Finns followed shortly after by the other Scandinavians. So it's, they drink so much, I mean, maybe because it's dark all the time in the winter and they need something to keep themselves awake. Um, so this uh, big coffee pot, it's like the coffee pot water tower, as I pointed out, is up in Washington Island. So it's the very tip of Door County. You take a ferry across to see this and they used to, it's actually on wheels and they used to bring it in the town festival it has a little window here. They used to have a couple of young Norwegian women in their bunads, their traditional dress, and they would be passing out cups of coffee to everyone coming there. Because you have to, any meeting you have, have, you have to have coffee. You have the big percolator that has to be going, right? Um, and then the other essential thing was smur or butter, right? So smurbre essentially means butter bread. So it's open faced sandwiches. And it's Okay, so Smur, in doing some of my research back to my family, uh, the little town that they came from in Norway, they list all the different families and the wealth. They didn't, they didn't write in terms of how much money they made or how much land they had. They talked in terms of the Smurskat, which is the butter tax. So how much butter tax they paid each year. So how much butter they had was how wealthy they were. Um, and there's actually, uh, they're about what, six, seven years ago, there was a big butter shortage back in Norway. And so they were looking desperately for butter because you need it for all your cookies and everything around Christmas time. So they asked Sweden, okay, well, can you bring us, give us some butter? The Swedes wouldn't do it. They wouldn't give up any butter. Finally, the Danes who have all their farms down there gave them some butter. And I've actually heard now in Minnesota, there's a little bit of a cream butter shortage as well. So we're, we're in trouble here as well, okay. And they brought this tradition, this love of butter over here to Minnesota, because at the Minnesota State Fair every year, we have the dairy princesses from the different regions of the state that go down to Falcon Heights near St. Paul. And they sit there in a big cooler and they have their head sculpted in butter, right? And here we have, this is Princess Kay of the Milky Way holding a tray of butter with all sorts, with her dress made out of butter labels, right? And I heard, after the state fair, what they do with that giant bust of butter, uh, each one of the dairy princesses gets to take it home with them. Okay, it's because what else, what else are you going to do with it, right? And they put it in their fridge, and then during the course of the year, they kind of carve away at their head and eat more of their, their ears and their, their nose. So some of these other uh, recipes that we've, we since don't really eat so much, like salt cod, this dried cod, we don't, I mean, you can still find this at certain Scandinavian places, but it's really not a staple as it used to be. This used to be, if all of the other food wouldn't come through, you would have your salt cod that you would soak overnight and then have a nice fish dinner the next day. 
because it keeps essentially indefinitely. But now with refrigeration and other ways of preserving food, we don't need to do that. We can have fresh fish or frozen fish. But a lot of the, the fishing tradition has kept up. So uh, a lot of the Scandinavians came here because of all of the lakes. And so they would start fishing, especially commercial fishing operations up on, in, on Lake Superior. So this is a the Norwegian fisherman on the Great Lakes netting fish. Um, but you go up there now, and there are very few of these fish shops around anymore. There's, there are some, but really there used to be tons of smoke shops of where they would smoke the fish and you would get them fresh out of it. Um, I did find one though up in Door County, up in Washington Island, very Scandinavian area. Um, and they talked about, the, this was the restaurant here. So the fisherman owned this restaurant. He would go out fishing each day and then bring the catch back and serve it up for dinner. And so I asked, well, what's up with the lawyers thing? And he pointed this, that's what this, this painting of the fish is on the window. In Minnesota, I realized this is what we call eel pout or burbut and it's sort of a freshwater cod. And I asked, well, why in Wisconsin do you call them lawyers? And they said, well, they're ugly bottom feeding fish and they have a very small heart close to its anus. So that's, that was the whole thing there. I mean, it's being Wisconsin. And so one of the things that they do over in Wisconsin and on Lake Michigan uh, that we don't do so much here in Minnesota is they don't have, I mean, we have mostly fish fries, right, on Friday evening. There, it's a lot of fish boils, especially in the summer, which is much healthier, of course, which is much more kind of Scandinavian. That's usually how they would prepare the fish back in Scandinavia, too. So you have a big cauldron of boiling water. Um, you put in your vegetables, let them cook, put in your fish for like eight minutes, and then you put kerosene on the fire, have this big fireball, and then it causes it all to overflow and douse the flames. And it's quite dramatic. Um, and then of course, the other big thing we have is lutefisk. Um, so this is from Olson's up in North Minneapolis. They're still going strong. Uh, and they actually get these trucks coming in and they say that there's there probably a million dollars worth of dried fish in some of these trucks that they have. Um, so they still they soak them in lye, then they rinse them all off and prepare them. And that's, that's what you get it. So if you do it right, it's not supposed to be jello-like, but it does end up being like jello. And then finally, the last thing about food is jello, which is not a Scandinavian thing at all. Although there always needs to be some sort of binder in that hot dish, in that jello, in the aspic, in whatever it is. Um, so they, people put all sorts of crazy things in here. They put corn, they put olives and cream cheese and grated cheese and everything. There's celery flavored jello. And some of the Swedes that I would meet in the summer, they would even bring jello back to Sweden because there they can't get it that's, because it's all full of all these colorants and terrible things. Um, so there it's banned. So it's just like in the old days, they used to bring back blue jeans to Europe, and now it's jello. So bring jello to your friends. So back to the immigrants. So that, that's all sort of the Scandinavian presence you see here. But what about the voyage of these immigrants over? Um, so here's one of these beautiful advertising brochures that looks so fabulous. Um, and there's another one from Gothenburg right to New York. And then I started doing some research about these trips and how, how it would have been. Um, and one of the letters that this fellow wrote back to his to friends back in Scandinavia said, on this trip, you would have to search long and hard to find such a blasphemous brood of vipers as on the boat. They were all rejects, foul language and cheating all day long. Steerage became a regular brothel. People gambled their clothes away and fistfights ensued. We had four prostitutes and at least five thieves. One thief stole from the next. So not exactly a glowing, uh, glowing drip of the, this cruise line, right? And the earliest uh, immigrants that came over had to bring all of their own food. So resmat for en persona is travel food for one person. So they would have to bring this all with them. And of course, they have their smir, so their butter, and their cafe. Right? You have to have those things, otherwise you can't survive without that. So when they got here, so this is a little immigrant house that they moved down to the state fairgrounds. I just love this how the, the chimney conveniently goes on the other side of the window there. 
when they got there were sort of certain towns that became very Scandinavian because they would want to go where other people would speak their language, of course. Um, so for the Norwegians, one of the big towns uh, was Brooklyn because all the early uh, the seamen there would stay there early on. There was New Sweden out in the west that became part of the colonies very early on. Um, so then Chicago, Madison, Minneapolis, Seattle were some of the big places, and then many other towns in between. So this is a photo from Minneapolis at the time with signs in Swedish. Um, now, when they got here, they always wanted to stay with other people so they could understand and basically live their whole lives speaking Swedish or Norwegian or Danish. Now, in Minneapolis at the time, so this is from 1885, and I found a letter so I'm from, I live in South Minneapolis, so I consider it a pretty great place, but back at the time, they didn't think it was so nice. Now, Minneapolis at the time was also, we had the first bridge across the Mississippi, which is a really big deal at the time. Now, a Danish immigrant wrote back home telling people not to come because it was so bad here. Now, the Danes had a little bit higher standards than the other Scandinavians because Norway was dirt poor. Norway was the poorest country in Europe at the time. So this Danish immigrant wrote back in 1885 about Minneapolis. He said, I have never seen such horrible filth as in this city. Thousands of loads of manure and household trash are piled up in the yards and some even in the streets. If a person has to remove some of it due to lack of space, he simply throws it in the Mississippi River which provides the city's drinking water. The bodies of dead dogs and cats lie in the streets by the hundreds, okay? So not actually a glowing review. Um, so a lot of these immigrants moved here because of the mills, of course. So first there was the lumber mills and then the grain mills, the, the flour mills. Um, the problem with those mills was that they were dangerous and it's this new technology. So Minneapolis soon became known as the prosthetic capital of the world. And still to this day, that Minneapolis has one of the largest producers of prosthetics. Actually, I have students who are studying prosthetics. Um, and so this, because of all of these mills. Um, so a lot of these immigrants then decided they were going to move out to the country. Okay, so this is after, you know, the, the treaties with the Dakota basically pushing them off the land. And so this land, quote unquote, opened up as they called it. Um, so these are Norwegian immigrants out in South Dakota and if you can see in the background, there's not a tree in sight, nothing, okay? And they're living in this dirt house there on the prairie, the sod house. Somehow, though, they managed to have their suit and tie and all their clothes in perfect shape, which I don't know how on earth they would actually be able to do that. And so then they would still, as I mentioned early, scrimp and save to send their kids to college because education was still viewed as one of the highest priorities. So if they were lucky enough to have trees on their land, then they made one of these little immigrants cabins. So this is a cabin from 1858 down south of Albert Lee that we actually were able to stay in because they now have it as a little bed and breakfast there. And this is a sign of a good carpenter that makes a perfect uh, right angle here on the end. You know, we think of log cabins that you have the wood sticking out at the end. This is actually how it was supposed to be because then later on they would cover it up with clapboard on the outside. With, and so a lot of those old uh, prairie houses that you'll see that aren't log cabins actually are underneath it all. And probably at the time they didn't have air conditioning either. So they said about the Norwegians that you could always tell a Norwegian town because there was two churches because they never got along. So there's a big split in the Norwegian church um, so there'd always be a couple, two, three, two. actually I was just down in Decora and they said how there were three, four Norwegian churches, Lutheran churches, because they all split from each other all the time. So this is down in uh, Logan Square in Chicago, right next to the Minhirken, which is a Norwegian language church, similar to the Mindehirken in Minneapolis. This is a Norwegian Baptist church, which is rather unusual. Um, so when they would build a church out on the prairie, they'd never heard of, of tornadoes and all these. So this is what could happen if they weren't properly uh, cemented in. Um, this, the Finns, on the other hand, the first building they would always build would be the sauna. So this is the oldest sauna in Minnesota, 1868, uh, out just in, near Kokato, Minnesota. 
Um, <clears throat> so the reason they built the sauna first is because this is where they were, would get clean. And so this is, and then from there, they would build the other outbuildings around. Now, <clears throat> the saunas, this, uh, most of the houses didn't really have indoor plumbing. There were the, the public baths and there were the family saunas. This family sauna is still there up in Duluth. You can still see it. Uh, there's the famous sauna up in Ely, Minnesota. Like if you go up on the trail and you're in the Boundary Waters, you can go there afterwards. <clears throat> now, here, this is in Annadale, Minnesota. So a lot of the other people didn't know what to make of these fins. You know, like, oh, they're naked and they have these birch boughs that they're beating themselves with to get the blood pumping. So I found, uh, they talked about the black fins. And so I was like, what is this? Because they used to take the ash, because ash is actually very clean. It's one of the cleanest things. And they would wipe down their body with ash. Um, so one of the things uh, from the WPA Guide to Minnesota, it talked about the, the fins and how everybody was very nervous about them. And it said, a suspicious farmer accused the fins of practicing magic and of worshiping pagan deities. Entire families, he claimed, wrapped themselves in white sheets and retreated to a small square building set apart from the dwellings and worshiped their gods, calling upon them to bring rain and wrath and good harvest to fins and wrath down upon their neighbors. So even this one, they think of that it's all like witchcraft that they're doing. Like, what is this strange, strange habit? Now, at the same time, we hear, okay, all of the, uh, with the Finns and many others, when they, they were coming to, to the new world here to escape all of the old wars back in Europe that were just constant. I mean, look what's going on there now. Um, it's just constant, all these old wars, they wanted to just come and live a normal life, farm and do whatever they had to do. Uh, so when World War I then broke out, people, you know, and they started the draft, people thought, wait, there's no way I'm going back there, especially after that ocean voyage. I'm not going back there to fight, no chance. So Minnesota, they set up this Minnesota Commission of Public Safety, which all sounds all well and fine, but they were given near dictatorial powers to go and round up anybody they wanted, just like Putin's doing right now in Russia, like going and giving all these draft notices. That's what they would do in Minnesota. Um, and so many people, we, hear all, we always hear about the heroes, supposed heroes that went and fought or died and all these memorials, but many of the people just simply disappeared out into the woods and just tried to escape all of this. So habeas corpus was gone. If you were suspected at all, you would be locked up, right? Um, so it was a very, very dangerous time to be a protester against any sort of war, okay? Um, up in Duluth, they had the Americanization Committee so we have this idea that all of these immigrants came over and that they wanted to become American. The reason we think that is because they eventually did become American, but many of them wanted to hold on to their culture, their old language. They had no, I mean, it was fine here, like English, okay, they could use it as sort of a trade language, but they had no reason to give up their old language. Um, so the idea of giving up your Norwegian, Swedish, whatever your ancestry was, and become American and not have that anymore. They didn't want that. They came here to have a good life and then hopefully make some money and go back. So many of them did go back. Um, my great great uncle went back uh, to to Norway. Um, so it was a it was a kind of a dangerous time to question any of this. Um, and so this is one of my favorite signs that I found. So don't be suspected. Use American language. America is our home, right? So we apparently we don't speak English, we speak American, right? Um, and one of the ironies up in Lionel Lakes a while ago, about six years ago, they passed this law that you could only use English in all official government capacities there, which is kind of strange because that's what they're doing anyway. The only reason to do that is, is anti-immigrant, right? Ironically, between Lionel Lakes and uh, Lindstrom and down to Stillwater, they called that the Swedish Socialist Triangle because it's the largest uh, capacity of Swedes that we have in the entire country. Um, and so up until, I mean, you still go there. I mean, I, I have friends out there and their parents often will speak Swedish still in that area. Um, so they had no desire to transfer, to get rid of Swedish and move on to English. 
And now it's basically used as a tool against other immigrants, even though 100 years ago they were doing the same thing there. So with this, um, so my grandfather, for example, he grew up in South Minneapolis and he only spoke, well, his mother is Swedish, his father is Norwegian, and so he spoke kind of a mixture of the languages. He went to kindergarten and he only spoke that language, this Norwegian, they called it Svorsk, kind of this misc of the two, mix of the two languages. Um, and he only spoke that, and then he would get in trouble with the teachers when he didn't speak English, right? Um, and I asked him, like, well, why don't you teach me Norwegian? Like, why didn't you pass this on to my dad? And why didn't you pass this on? Because I would love to be bilingual in Norwegian and, and English. And he said, we're in America. We speak English now. It's better that way, right? And so even now, how many decades after World War I, after World War II, they're still nervous about being locked up because these, you know, that they speak another language. Um, so one of these uh, Norwegians said, I have nothing against the English language. In fact, I use it myself every day. But if we don't teach our children Norwegian, what will they do when they get to heaven? All right, so then, okay. My grandfather was very proud of being Norwegian, even though he wouldn't actually teach me the language. Um, and then he always thought he always wanted to vote for, you know, more Norwegian candidates or Swedish candidates, right? And so, you know, I thought, well, okay, there's just sort of more middle of the road, calm, sort of Walter Mondale types. And then I started learning a little bit more about the politics and it wasn't even close to true. Um, so the nonpartisan league was the socialist wing of the Republican Party, okay? If you can believe that now with what's happening. So especially out in North Dakota, they're very, very strong out there. Um, so then here in Minnesota, we have Charles Lindbergh. So this is the father of the aviator. Um, so he was nonpartisan DF or nonpartisan and farmer labor. He would go around to some of these smaller towns and he would sometimes be run out of town because of the speeches he would give and they would hang up effigies of him. So, I mean, it was a very dangerous time. So sometimes they even shoot at his car as he was leaving town. Um, so he then uh, died kind of young and then um, Floyd B. Olson so they called, took over as sort of the, the caretaker of the farmer labor party, became governor, and he talked about turning Minnesota into a cooperative commonwealth. Um, and radical things. And he was, you know, very kind of chummy. This here he is with the Iowa governor, and this is Floyd of Rosedale, which is the the prize that that the Golden Gophers and the Iowa team fight for. Um, so he, a lot of his policies then became what essentially were was the New Deal, and he probably could have become even vice president, but he as well died kind of young. So when we look around the state and around Wisconsin and Minnesota, we just see cooperatives everywhere. And we just sort of assume that this is, well, this is how you do business, right? Um, that you have profit sharing, you do all of these things because we don't wanna have those big robber barons like you know James J. Hill or some of these other taking all of our money, okay? And this began down, so this idea of cooperatives is actually an English idea that became that Denmark kind of glommed onto and then the rest of Scandinavia. And then that's how it made it up here in, into the Midwest. So we have far more cooperatives than anywhere else in the country. This idea that we have to band together to do this. So the, the Scandinavians realized they had to band together to survive. And uh, began, it all goes back to butter because there was this, uh, woman down, this Danish woman down in Iowa, that she was a single mom and she had to, she had this farm though, and she had to sell her cream to the, to the local for-profit creamery. And she was just getting a terrible price for, for all of her cream to make butter. And this, this Danish bishop was visiting and he saw this ter these terrible conditions and he said, no, you can't do this. You have to, you have to form a cooperative with all of this. And so he went around the, the Midwest giving what he called butter sermons. So in other words, you have to hold on to this butter. So we have these cooperative creameries all over the place to, to preserve all of this. And this is, we also have electric cooperatives, we have gas cooperatives, we have food cooperatives, and this is kind of the, the business model that we wanna have to, uh, to preserve all of the, the wealth that we have. 
Um, so especially Superior, Wisconsin was sort of the, the home of a lot of this. Um, and it still was up until recently. Um, so they would send out these dance troops and everything to all of the little Scandinavian areas and all the cooperatives uh, to, to promote all the, the co-ops. Um, and there was a big battle between a lot of them were communists against the, the more, uh, the less radical socialists. Okay. Um, and so here, you know, this is a Scandinavian, a lot of the, uh, all of the news was transmitted by that language. So this is a, a Finnish newspaper. We were just over at the Swedish Institute the other day, and all of the money to build that originally, that mansion, was from a Swedish language newspaper. I mean, so they just became fabulously wealthy through newspapers. Um, this was kind of an interesting story. This was a bookstore in Minneapolis that is modern Boston Tea Party. This is someone left this sign there. They broke all of his windows. Modern Boston Tea Party, no reds wanted in Minneapolis, right? So, and then of course we had the Tea Party, the other conservative Tea Party, right? Okay, so it's kind of a, a danger at that time. Um, Red Star Coffee with a hammer and sickle from Superior, Wisconsin, sent out, okay? And I did a little bit of research, like, hey, where did all of this start? So the, the Wobblies, the international workers, they began, one of the big places they began was up in Duluth, okay? And I found there was this Finnish language school that basically would teach all of these young activists. And, you know, it's a lot in Finnish and so then up in the mines, of course, on the Iron Range and then in Michigan. And I went up there like, okay, where is this building? Because I found all these great pictures. It's just an apartment building now. And I went and talked to some of the people. They had no idea about all of that history. So it's all right there. It's just it's been kind of covered up. We just sort of moved on. We've kind of forgotten about all of this radical history that we have. Um, and then, of course, we have the idea of giving women the vote. Okay, so it's been what now? It's been a hundred years now. When a lot of these Scandinavians, when they came over, the Scandinavian women had the right to vote back home, and then they come here, this land of freedom and democracy, and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, we can't even vote here. So they were out on the street protesting all the time. And so, I mean, all of these crazy, <laughs> um, crazy <laughs> posters that they had. Um, and of course, during the wars, when women had to go and work, when the men were fighting overseas, it's like, well, wait, now we don't even get the right to vote here. So finally that happened. So another thing, my grandfather would, he'd always, you know, kind of promote the Scandinavians, like good, clean living, good politics and all this kind of stuff. And I realized like a lot of the things he told me weren't quite true um, because it wasn't clean living. Um, so this just means beer, right? And so the Vikings would always have beer. They'd like have to, any pact they made, they'd have to have beer. Um, this is from a tablecloth cloth from the Sons of Norway. Now the Sons of Norway began as a teetotaling organization, so it was anti-drinking. Um, anti and of course the Volstead Act, Andrew Volstead was a Norwegian congressman from Granite Falls, Minnesota. And all of these Scandinavian women especially were tired of their husbands just being drunk all the time. And so they pushed Andrew Volstead to push through, which became prohibition, essentially. Um, so everybody talks now about prohibition. It was a disaster. It didn't work. There was a good reason to have prohibition at the time. It may not work, but you know everyone's drinking all the time. Um, so these Scandinavians come over, and this whole idea with snuff or snus, as they call it, notice that there's Norseman snuff, there's Copenhagen, Skoll. It's all these Scandinavian names. Actually, just when I was just down in Decorah, and I was talking to this Norwegian fisherman from, he was visiting from Norway, and he swears that this staves off seasickness, okay, which I can't believe because it makes me kind of sick, but you know, it's like, oh, you have to have this. So snus became synonymous with all the crazy wildness of these Scandinavians. So this is snus Avenue, this is snus Boulevard in Minneapolis. Okay, so this is Cedar Avenue. Okay, Dania Hall um, and all the, you know, all the bars and everything. Uh, Chicago as well has its Snooze Avenue. Um, Seattle had Snooze Junction. So there's all of these different areas that was basically associated with that. Um, and even, where's my good quote that I have? James J. Hill 
said, so James J. Hill, who built all the railroads, said, give me Swedes, snuff, and whiskey, and I'll build a railroad through hell. Um, so just as they had all of the snooze and all the craziness and the wildness, there was also the temperance movement. So I mentioned the Volstead Act came into play. Um, so the Finns were very divided with this. So there were the church Finns, and then there were the Hall Finns. The, so the Hall Finns were much more radicalized, much more political, and the church Finns were much more into the temperance movement. Um, or they talked about the holy Finns versus the happy Finns. Um, so this is Temperance Corner, kind of out near where the sauna is. Now, because when the Volstead Act went through, so Prohibition went through, they always tried to find an excuse, well, how are we going to get people to drink anyway, right? So there's all these stories about everyone bringing in whiskey and Al Capone and all of that. So up on Door County on this little island, this is supposedly the longest running saloon in the country because they never shut down during prohibition, partially because it's on an island, they could get away with it. So what they would have here is they realized there was a clause in prohibition that said, well, doctors and stuff, they can still have their little medicines that have high alcohol content, right? And so they said, okay, well, that'll work. They just put a doctor behind the bar. People come in and have their aches and pains. They fill out a prescription. They give them some shots of bitters and everybody's happy, right? So it never shut down during Prohibition. Um, and then I found this, okay, so during, uh, during Prohibition here in St. Paul, there was, this was a, from a storefront, and vino, which is kind of a combination of, of wine and beer, right? So this is, okay, you could get a prescription for your wife. So no man loves a tired, nervous woman who's drinking so much coffee, right? So you just get her drunk and you can win back your husband's love. All right, so then some of these other things, we found lots of these weird cures that they had in what they called the black books. Um, so this is bloodletting. The black books were what the immigrants brought over that were full of all these old wives cures, when to plant, um, these kind of things, pat, potions and things passed down. Like if you were sick in town, this is where you would go. I was just down in Hanska, Minnesota, and there was a woman there, sort of a healer in town, that had one of these books and had all these crazy things. Um, one, of the, one of the cures that she had was to cure alcoholism, which was very common. You take three baby mice, you put them in hard liquor for 14 days, and then you drink it. And I guarantee after that, you're never going to want to drink again. Um, so finally, this is my last little section here. Okay, so once all these immigrants made it out here to the, the plains and all that, some of the strangeness begins. So here we have the world's largest paperclip up at the Norwegian camp. So the paperclip, because it was a symbol of the resistance against the Nazis, because the paperclip was invented in Norway. You go out to Milan, Minnesota, and they have this big Norwegian museum. There's lots of these photos of dead jackrabbits. So what they would do is they would go, they get to a section of land, and they would get 10 guys on each side with their guns. They would walk towards the middle, flush out all the jackrabbits, and kill them all, right? And that's why there are hardly any jackrabbits around anymore. Um, and they would put them on a car, go around town honking their horn, and sell them for a buck each. So you have a nice rabbit dinner and a rabbit pelt. Um, this hair, uh, these are all the hair from all the generations passed on before they had photographs of everyone. It had a double-decker toilet. It says uh, Swedes on the bottom, Norwegians on the top. Um, they had the Lusikofter sweaters, which are essentially lice, which means lice cover. Um, and that's, you know, as they eventually would be covered in lice. Um, and then Munzing wear, my theory is that a lot of these sweaters People, once they wore out, people would take them and they would put them in boiling water, rub them and make felt out of them, and then wear them for long johns. And that's where Munzing wear got their idea for their union suits, their double layer union suits. So you didn't waste anything. You wouldn't waste any seed sacks, any flower sacks. They had these flower sack dresses that they would have. Um, and then finally, the last thing that they talked to, something that really surprised me about these Scandinavians, they brought this idea of what they called night courting to 
Minnesota and to Wisconsin. It's mostly in southern Sweden and in Norway. And it was this idea that young people, they would have one day off a week, Saturday evening, that they could go out and get together, play music, talk, have fun. And then one thing would lead to another and a baby would come along. And well, then that couple would get married and go and start their life and have a farm. So they brought that tradition here to the Midwest and people were horrified. They thought, oh my goodness, you know, these Scandinavians coming, just breeding, like that's not how it's done. And, you know, you have to think that the landed gentry here, the English, you know, they had a very Victorian way of doing things. And the Scandinavians said, no, 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 your system doesn't really work because you get these, this couple married, then what if they can't have kids? Then they're sort of destitute. Our system works much better and everyone's happy. So it might be why it's maybe a little bit more, more liberal up here. And so that's where you have up in Viking, Minnesota, it actually is the Norwegian bachelor capital of the world because they had all these Norwegian farmers had these beautiful farms and no women, right? So they had this big contest in the Grand Forks Herald newspaper saying like, we need women to come up here to the frozen Northland and help out these young bachelor farmers. And so this is an example of, a, this is from Mankato, but it's the idea of these uh, Scandinavian weddings that they would have out on the prairie. So finally, my last slide is up in Duluth, they're so proud of their Scandinavian background that they even have Nordic waste up there. So, all right. Well, thank you. And were there questions? We, are we, is there time for questions, or are we all out of time now? Which is fine. Yeah, we we can have questions. Um, is there any online questions, Bailey? Um, we can take questions from uh, from the audience here. Anybody? No questions. No. All right. Well, well, good. That means I'm, I'm right. I won. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I do have a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, we have a question. Maybe, maybe if I can ask one first, okay. um, since I have the mic. <laughs> um, those are amazing photographs. Um, so as part of your research, um, you know, I'm assuming you did some archival research in that. And then could you kind of talk about your experience doing that archival research, getting those photographs where I um, think maybe some of our audience, audience member might be interested in doing additional work on that? Yeah. Um, well, so a lot of the photos I just took myself, some of the color photos. The archival ones, though, uh, I mean, the Minnesota Historical Society, of course, has a great, amazing collection, and they put uh, at least half of their collection up online so you can see those that way. But I found too, so many of the county or the town historical societies that you go to that people see that little museum and they never go to, they have actually amazing collections and bizarre things that you would never expect. Like up in Thief River Falls, they have the, you know, the Pembema, or no, what, it's the, I don't forget the name of the county up there. It's not Pembina, it's another one up there that I, Pennington or something. No, it's, I think, but I think Thief River, Thief River Falls is Pennington or something. Um, anyway, so they have a great, you know, like all these little historical museums and all these kind of oddities that you find in there. Yeah, so as, as a researcher myself, I spent days in the archives and is there any, um, you know, you mentioned some oddity stuff. It's, is there, could you name maybe like a, a couple of things that you found that that was really surprising? Yeah, all of this. <laughs> No, I mean, the the thing that really surprised me was those black books, that there are only three of those that made it, that they know of, that made it to Minnesota. Um, and these black books, the church condemned. They said, Do you don't want, this is all the devil's work. They called them the devil's books. Um, and the only way that you can get rid of these books, according to the church, was you had to write your name in blood in the book and then put it literally under the church or under the altar in the church. Um, and so when they've been doing excavations back in Norway, they've, in some of the churches, they find like stashes of these black books here. Um, so the only one, there's one, there's one down in Hanska, there's one in, at, down in Northfield at Naha, and there's one somewhere else in Minnesota. But that's, those are the only ones I, I know of. Great. Um... We have a couple of uh, questions from the Zoom audience. Um, first question is from Nick. Um, can you talk more about the temperance movement, the religious connotations, and why, what it 
comes from or, or where it comes from? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about the temperance movement, but I mean, it was, okay, so Andrew Volstead was one of the big proponents of it, as I mentioned. Um, and so the, the women, the Scandinavian women, among others, were just very vocal and very loud about, I mean, and they essentially wanted three things. They wanted the temperance movement, so they wanted prohibition. They wanted, they were anti-war, so they didn't want the U.S. involved in all of these things. And uh, the third one is they wanted the right to vote. So those were the three big issues. I mean, and so people think, you know, I just find it interesting with prohibition. Everyone's like, oh, it's a, it was a disaster. It didn't work. And it's like, but I mean, there's a, the story about this woman going into a bar with an ax and smashing up all the bottles because she was tired of her husband coming drunk all the time. Um, so there are a lot of stories like that of just, you know, because people thought, oh, well, I can't drink the water because the water will make you sick. So I have to drink whiskey, you know, or beer. Um, Bailey, did you want to ask your question? Okay, wonderful. Um, the next one is um, questions from Kristen. Um, can you talk about the relationship that the Scandinavian immigrants had with the indigenous people in the area um, where they move into? Yeah, no, so that's a, an interesting, because I have a whole chapter in the book about, okay, there's up in uh, Alexandria, Minnesota, they have the Kensington Runestone, and of course, uh, there's lots of talk, you know, people, and for, in my opinion, it became sort of this marker of the Scandinavians wanted it to be like, okay, well, we were here 1362, that they, there was someone already here, so in other words, we're just coming back, right, and so there was that whole idea. Um, personally, I loved this idea that it could be actually valid, but all the historians say like, no, it's, it was made up basically as this thing. So, I mean, there was this idea of like, okay, well, they're just coming in, they're poor immigrants, but well, who's being kicked off the land too? So, I mean, there was definitely not an easy relationship to say the least. And briefly in one of your side, slide, you mentioned the, um, the, some of the new federal laws that have um, opened up new land for immigrants. Yeah, that's how, they, that's how they refer to it, right? Sure, yeah. like new lands, right? Yep. And so. Open new land, it's all for, you know, well, and the, yeah, the Homestead Act, 1862, so as long as you stayed on that land for five years and improved it, it was yours, right? Um, so the next question is, how did you become a professor of Italian? <laughs> oh, Italian, uh, well, Growing up in Minnesota, I wanted to go somewhere warm. So I, I was an exchange student over in Italy for a year, highly recommended, send people abroad for a year and loved it, right? Um, especially after, I mean, but I, you know, I've come back to Minnesota. So I've been, I lived over there for almost five years total. And yeah. Wonderful, and Bailey. Sure. Okay, so you showed us that picture of uh, those like women's like votes for women sign and they referenced like crazy people and like said like, oh, that's not chivalrous. Like you need to like consider all of us people. And then you also mentioned that like they were really into prosthetics and like kind of like to be so willing to adapt disabled bodies to the world or like make changes in the world for disabled people. Um, was that something that was like particularly strong in Scandinavian culture? Have you seen other remnants of like kind of a bigger acceptance than like Victorian traditions and like that side of Western Europe? Um, I don't know, like with the prosthetics in Scandinavia, I don't know about that at all. I just know, I mean, in Minneapolis, it sort of became de facto by fault that we all of a sudden needed all of these prosthetics here. Sure. Um, because people were losing limbs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's kind of an interesting, uh, so uh, Charles Lindbergh, his grand, well, the aviator's grandfather lost a limb, and there's like this whole section yeah. about him losing a limb. It's really kind of sad, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the accepting, so I don't know that I really answered your question, though. I guess like, Perhaps it was just because they came from working class backgrounds, so that was like everybody had problems or like everybody was already a degenerate per se in the eyes of larger society. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, like, do you think there was 
in Scandinavian culture, a greater culture of acceptance when it comes to disabled people or sick people or crazy people? Um, I want to say yes, but I have no, no. reason. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I mean, that that one slide with um, the women there, they I mean, they're what they were saying was that, OK, we let all these other people vote, but we don't let women vote. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. I got you. Yeah. So why don't we let women vote? And it's like people said, well, it doubles the crazy vote. And it's mm -hmm, like, well, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Like, you know, who's it's already me more. So gotcha. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the in person audience? None at all. Um, yes. Oh. I was wondering if the woman who just spoke was also wondering if uh, a stronger sense of feminism arose out of the Scandinavian culture. I believe you said they they already had the vote. Yes, Women yes, that definitely. Yes, okay. definitely. Can you say anything more about that, Eric? Yeah, well, and even, I mean, it, it was then because they had the right to vote. And now, I mean, Scandinavia is way ahead of us because, I mean, a lot of the uh, like boards of big companies, they have to have a certain, they can't just be all men, like in government. I mean, it's it's far more, I mean, and then go, extending on to, well, uh, rights when women uh, give birth, that they have a whole year off of work paid for by the government, you know. To, I mean, all of these things just to help women, I mean, that make it kind of even the scales a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what do you think historically, though, led to women having the right to vote much earlier in uh, the Scandinavian, I don't know if all the Scandinavian countries were, gen and generally speaking, uh -huh. what was it in the culture that they said, yeah, women need to vote as well as men? I, I don't know, you know why. I mean, okay. it just kind of was. It's just like, okay. well, why not? You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, because they were so much, you know, life was hard in those places. And, you know, the fishermen would be, they'd be off and they would have the women kind of run the show. And so then all of a sudden, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, but I mean, it just, it right. just was that yeah. they were always much more part of the decision making. I mean, supposedly going back all the way to Viking times, you know, you have all some, there's these Viking chieftains who are women. Oh. They've found like in some of the boats, the boat burials they found, there's like, they're women who are mm -hmm. the chieftains. Oh. Another question here. So we have an election coming up, and um, it appears that Minnesota may be going more Republican, more conservative. And when do you think, and what do you think caused the people who are promoting the cooperatives and such a communal way of living and talking socialism and communism? Um, what has brought that conservative movement along, especially with the Scandinavians? There was, I mean, a lot of the Scandinavian, I mean, there was, you know, sort of that change from Republicans to Democrats, because sort of, a lot of the Norwegians were Republicans because they were um, anti-slavery. Um, and so that was, and then, but then when the, there's kind of this switch around that the Democrats became much more progressive and such. Now, I think, you know, communism and then, of course, socialism have become sort of these buzzwords of everything. You know, everyone's worried that they're going to take over the world and all of this. Um, and, you know, Nikita Khrushchev banging his shoe and all of that kind of stuff. But then uh, there also is this idea with like the nonpartisan league and some of these ideas. For example, North Dakota, which tends to vote mostly Republican, but North Dakota has the North Dakota State Bank, which gives students like super, uh, the interest rates on student loans for students is super low. So they all have that. So if you wanna to go to college, go to North Dakota, right? That's where you're gonna get a better deal. And for farmers and all that, they don't, they don't allow corporate farming. Um, so you can't have these mega farms. And then they have the North Dakota State Mill, which, okay, I talked about Minneapolis, how there's Mill City and you know the Pillsbury's and everybody was making all of this money from all of the, the farmers and in North Dakota and other places. Um, so in North Dakota, they said, we're not gonna, just as with the co-ops, with the butter, we're not gonna send all of our grain there. We're gonna keep it here. So there's the North Dakota State Mill that's still running to this day um, that shares the wealth with everyone. So there is a real sense 
of fairness and profit sharing, and they don't want that wealth. And I don't under, there's, there's sort of a disconnect there of why then we're allowing these super wealthy people like Elon Musk and Bezos and Zuckerberg and everyone, all those multi-billionaires to not be taxed. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So I don't, under, I don't understand. So we'll see what happens, a few weeks. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, and so if you all can um, give a round of applause for Eric and thanks for your presentation tonight.